Welcome to this 23 alumni event. Um, as last year, we've taken a topic we think is interesting and important. And we've asked three of our three of our wonderful colleagues in the government, an ancient medieval and modern historian, to talk about the topic in relation to their research interests questions. Um, Professor Page, I'm a medievalist. What we're going to do is they're going to have about, um, the, the talk's going to be about 15 minutes. Um, they're going to be straight after each other, and then we'll have questions at the end. The questions can be specific or for all three speakers, and um, this will take place over about an hour, and then we have a reception um, in the South Quarters in the main museum building. Well, thank you all very much for being here, and I'm uh, very pleased to be invited to, to contribute on this uh, very uh, topical theme. Um, Demagogues and populism, as you see, uh, with the, the picture, of it. I've written it on the slide, but just in case, that's the, the scene of the populist uh, accent in, uh, in classical Athens, the, the speakers of Ostrom, effectively, of the popular assembly. Um, quite a, a big topic, obviously, populism. What I will focus on is this, what I, I take to be a key element of it, uh, the perception of a, an opposition between uh, the people and the elite, the idea that the uh, the elite, whoever they are exactly, uh, are typically working, or always working, in, in opposition to the will of the people, which is somehow, uh, you know, undivided, united uh, will, uh, frustrated only by the elite working against them. And that idea, uh, more than as it uh, may seem, contemporary as it may seem, um, uh, is actually very prominent in classical Latins. And, um, let's see if the uh, slides are moving, yes. Um, uh, one text that, uh, that makes this really central is uh, a short account of the, the, the history of the, the Athenian constitution, constitution being a bit of an overstatement, but the Athenian political system uh, by Aristotle, one of his students, which features uh, in one chapter this kind of survey of 5th century Athenian history, which, as you see, is structured uh, as an opposition between, on the one hand, always a, a champion of the, of the, uh, the common people, the demos, on the other hand, always a champion of the elite, uh, referred to in various terms. You see, um, the respectable people, the notables, the wealthy, the prominent, there's a whole range of synonyms for that, uh, all indicating that these are better people than the common man. Uh, the names you see, uh, the string of them appears in the lines. Um, and then the key uh, moment of change, uh, often focused on as the beginning of proper populism, uh, is when this character Cleon becomes the, the leader or you know, the champion of the people. Um, and uh, Aristotle here says that he, he, he was the first of those popular leaders that didn't have a good reputation also amongst the elite. I.e., you know, there's always been a contrast between elite and common people, but the leaders of both sides were pretty much a respectable person, you know, even if they regretted, some of them regrettably supported the, the will of the people. Um, but Cleon was a different. Um, uh, ball game to work. Cleon uh, was not well reputed, uh, and you see why he was the first to shout from the rostrum, to use invective, and uh, worst of all, to hitch up his tunic while speaking. You can imagine what that would look like, uh, whereas the other spoke in an orderly fashion. Um, so, this is the, the image of the kind of you know, walker, shameless kind of demagogue uh, who appeals just to the people with no concern for uh, what other people, uh, you know, better people, uh, think is. Um, and then the, the, the summary at the end of this, uh, this list, uh, from Cleon onwards, uh, the, the leaders of the people were always those most willing to act rashly and to gratify oi polloi, literally, in the Greek, uh, without looking uh, beyond the short term, or by the definition I think, of populism. Um, and to, to suggest that this is not just you know, a political thinker looking back to the earlier century, um, but that this really does reflect something of the current political climate in the fifth century um, is this text, uh, which you usually know as the old oligarch. I've given it to Xenophon and later writer, but maybe not by him. Uh, another Athenian constitution, which is really structured, um, which takes as a premise, really, the idea that um, the elite has its interest, the common people have their interest, uh, and depending on the political system you have, one of these interests is going to be pursued. There's no such thing as a government for the interest of the whole community, the nation, or the city state. Uh, so democracy, democracy, according to this author, 
is very much a form of government where the common people pursue their interest at the expense of the elite. Just as oligarchy would be one where the elite pursues its interest at the expense of the common people. So this, this polarization is completely built into um, that perception of Athenian politics. Um, what we then uh, get, uh, more or less contemporary with the, um, the old oligarch, uh, date is not exactly known, but more or less contemporary, you get a satirical uh, comic plays which, uh, which make fun of these uh, popular leaders. Uh, here's one example, Aristophanes of Wasps. You see the text that the purpose was sort of sheep, significant like sheep, sitting in assembly of the on the picks. Um, so I should say this is satirical from an elite point of view. Like the sheep, the common people sitting uh, in assembly on the picks with the staffs and their cheapest coats, their cloaks. Uh, and these were being har uh, harangued by an omnivorous monstrosity with a voice like a pig on fire. They were shouting uh, from the... From the um, uh, and then the, you know, stop talking now, I know who you're talking about, it stinks of leather. I mean, Cleon uh, said to have been a, a tanner or a, a leather seller, anyway, but a smelly profession was always held against him. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is the sort of image you get, um, perhaps not uh, unlike some modern imagery of, uh, of demagogues. Um, uh, and, and he thought that was fairly harsh. I mean, if later on in the play, Aristophanes goes, uh, a couple of notches up, I think the text here. Uh, um, this is the poet speaking in his own, or through the chorus, but talking about himself and praising kind of his own bravery in facing his popular leader. And I faced off against the shark himself, etc., etc. The ring of a hundred cronies' heads licking and moaning around his face, a lethal voice again, a stench of a seal, an ogre's under balls, and a camel's ass. Right? That Greeks even knew what Kamaldas looked like is <laughs> quite surprising, but, but there you go. And again, uh, one could think of uh, the occasional modern uh, parallel, um, such as uh, similar imagery from uh, The Guardian. Uh, more significant, perhaps, is this, this other sort of um, satirical theme, this obsession with, with conspiracy. The idea that the common people are absolutely paranoid about the elite. Again, this is an elite perspective on that. And so Cleon, when he comes on stage for the first time in another play by the same Aristophanes, uh, these are his first words. By the 12 gods, you will be sorry for conspiring against the people all the time. Uh, someone is holding a cup who's just made a libation. What's with that cup? Uh, Calcidian cup, you must be conspiring you know, to stir up the Calcidians to revolt. And so it goes on. I've just given you three examples, but you know. Uh, uh, about a quarter of the man's dialogue in the play uh, is, is basically him accusing people of conspiring against something or other. Uh, I guess, oh, sorry, conspiring with someone or other, always against the Athenian people. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, again, it escalates, and um, in Wasps, we, we get this. Um, this is not specifically at Lyon, but this is where it's gone completely through the looking glass as with the, uh, the famous Burns Aren't Real uh, conspiracy. Um, you know, a, a character saying everything, you know, everything is conspiracy and tyranny these days. Uh, you, know, you, go, you go shopping for a fish, and if you buy the wrong kind of fish, the other fish uh, sellers will say, oh, obviously shopping for tyranny here. Uh, and if you say, okay, I'll buy a cheap fish, I was to not, not look like an elite person. Uh, but you make the mistake of asking for onions, you know, then the, the vegetable seller will complain that uh, with this demand for onions, you clearly fancy yourself as some kind of tyrant. You know, it's completely absurd at this point, and it's meant to be. This is Aristophanes' uh, suggestion that under the influence of these demagogues, uh, people have gone completely uh, mad, really, have become completely paranoid, and see a danger uh, from the elite to democracy everywhere. Um, beyond the political thought and um, uh, comedy, uh, we actually do also see populism uh, really institutionalized in this institution of ostracism. Um, <coughs> what you see here um, is a, a pile of pot shirts with names inscribed. Um, and, you, and you know, in Greek, you can probably uh, possibly recognize Themistocles uh, being the most. Uh, Popular or rather unpopular name on those shards, but there's a whole range of others. So what this is, is that <clears throat> uh, once a year, 
in Athens from 488 BC onwards, um, there was an opportunity, if there were enough people in favor of it, to have a, a sort of eviction vote. I mean, it's really, I say that I use that word because it's what you have in uh, reality TV show, it's like an eviction vote. Um, someone you don't like, you can vote out right, for 10 years. You don't have to give a reason. Uh, there's no campaigning or canvassing. You just said, okay, if there's someone you don't like, and the implication is a politician who you think is a particular danger to democracy, you know, a would-be tyrant or a crypto oligarch, you can vote him out for 10 years. After that, he can come back, but the assumption is his career will be, uh, you know, in tatters and he's no longer a threat. So this is done uh, for a while on an annual basis, and people are sent into exile for, you know, 10 years at a time. Uh, purely by the will of the people, right? So it's a quorum of 6,000 votes that you, 6,000 people need to vote in order for the, the vote to be valid, and whoever gets the most vote is out. No, no appeal of anything. So that seems to be an institution that really embodies populism in a very uh, extreme fashion. Uh, and we can see why, you know, the elite at the time was not all that happy with this, with this institution. Uh, but the other side of the point is that this is not all just, you know, uh, mad paranoia and shameless demagogy, but there, uh, in this case, really is uh, demonstrably a threat to a CD democracy, which all this elite criticism uh, glosses over. Um, if you've ever heard about the CD democracy, it will quite often be emphasized just how stable it was, and compared to other Greek um, states, I mean, Athens was pretty stable, but nevertheless, there's a little list there of episodes in which democracy was uh, in the first instance, seriously threatened, uh, an actual assassination of a popular leader, um, an attempt, and this is a common theme, to bring in the Spartans or some other external power to um, impose regime change in favor of the oligarchs um, in the middle of the fifth century there. Uh, and then in 411 and 404, famous notorious episodes where there was an actual coup d'etat, uh, in many cases, not, in both cases, not very long lived, but really quite brutal. And again, I've given you some details there. The 30 in 404, a very narrow oligarchy of 30 persons uh, in, in power, uh, backed by some uh, uh, young uh, thugs. Uh, Spartan Garrison is brought in to help them in 40 to 1,500 people executed. Uh, most of these, uh, most Athenian citizens have been about 30,000 at this time. So, you know, 90% of them disarmed and uh, thrown out of, uh, out of town are really, really. Uh, brutal and bloody uh, cool. So, um, you know, as I say, I mean, if uh, you're not paranoid, if they're really out to get you, and I think I want to stress that, uh, that despite the seeming excesses of populism, uh, there was in this case, in this Athenian case, at least a real uh, threat, I think, from uh, an elite that was not always very happy with democracy. Um, the other thing to note is that these demagogues that get such a, a really bad press were not necessarily quite as bad as our sources, which are all you know, elite uh, sources, make them out to be. Uh, Cleon, as I mentioned at the start, is a, is a good example. Um, I mean, it's very difficult. It's either very easy or very difficult to make this case, right? You can just say we can't trust those elite sources, you know, making fun of these demagogues. Uh, and this would have been my line, you know, before Trump came along, <laughs> and Boris came along. And we said, oh, this is just, you know, the elite nonsense. These were perfectly respectable politicians, uh, just because they were lower class, you know, they're being made fun of um, and dismissed. Uh, I'm not quite so sure now, but in the case of Cleon, uh, at least, there is one famous episode, at least, uh, where, which is held up in the first instance as an example of irresponsible demo demagogic um, policy making on the hoof. Um, where the Athenians at war with the Spartans have uh, got a bunch of Spartans surrounded on an island and the Athenian fleet is circling the island and the Spartans can't get off, but the Athenian fleet is too scared to land on the island and actually capture them. So this goes on and on and on. And then Cleon says, you know, typical uh, elite, you know, they can't be bothered to take drastic action. The generals, if the generals were men, you know, this thing would have long been sorted. Uh, at which point the assembly said, okay, you know, you, you go and like, you make know, you general. And then according to our source here, to sit these, he's supposed to wriggle out of it. Um, but they won't let him. Uh, and then Cleon says, okay, then I'll go. And you see the, the text. Um, he's not afraid of the Spartans, he says. I'll, I'll go there without any extra troops, just a few that were happening, uh, you know, lying around in Athens at the time. Uh, and with these troops, I will go over there and I'll bring back the Spartans prisoner uh, within 20 days or I'll kill them all. 
uh, and then to say that comment, uh, hot air, hilarious, you know, nobody thought he was able to do that, typical idiot demagogue, uh, and uh, for the elite this was a win-win, but either he would make an idiot of himself and nobody would listen to him anymore, in, anymore or he would actually catch the Spartans and then they would win the war. Um, uh, anyway, Klingon goes off and uh, you see right at the end what happens. Uh, and within 20 days, he comes back with all the Spartans as prisoners, which no one thought was possible. Um, Thucydides makes a big play of this being completely lucky. I mean, page after page after page, he explains uh, what accident happened here and uh, how lucky it was that it, uh, it was a fire and then it was raining and then the weather was bad and the weather was good. I mean, it's in, uh, everything explains what happened except Klingon's not events. And a lot of modern scholars have accepted this, but I think we should consider the possibility maybe. Uh, that Cleon had some idea of what he was doing, and that maybe, uh, despite being a, a leather seller by profession, uh, he was able to, uh, to uh, take decisive action uh, and take a really, uh, a, score a really major victory for Athens in this war, even as a general. Okay, um, final point then that I want you to make is that this is all about the fifth century in Athens. Um, in the fourth century, this seems to change. Uh, I may overstate my case a bit by saying no more demagogues. I mean, there's a few people still in the early fourth century BC that would clearly count as Cleon types, uh, more or less. <clears throat> um, but uh, after a decade or two, maybe at the most, we don't hear anyone being nominated as you know, the leader of the people anymore. Uh, and even the ones in the earlier decades uh, do not have this kind of stature of the fifth century ones. Um, so what's, what's happening? Um, we see at the same time this trend uh, towards, uh, well, you know, experts, the thing the most uh, uh, hated by the by extreme populist. Uh, you get people uh, specializing in being, I should explain, previously, if you were a politician, you could be a speaker, you could be an administrator, you could be a general, you know, from one month to the next. You had to do it all. Uh, but you get specialization at this point. Typically, some politicians become full-time politicians. They will only speak in the assembly, or they will get the admin jobs, or they will take the, the military positions, but not all at the same time. Um, you definitely get a trend towards professionalization. Um, partly, we see that because we start getting a new genre, manuals, technical manuals, people writing uh, uh, books on how to be a cavalry commander, and how to be a general, how to defend the city under siege. All of this gets written up agricultural manuals as well. Um, uh, and we get, in, in a more elitist vein, we get the likes of Plato and others uh, insisting um, that if you're going to be a politician, uh, you don't need to just have ideas, you have to have some knowledge, you know, you need to know about finance, you need to know about warfare. So there's a definite trend towards um, expertise, professionalization. And finally, and this is the point most often emphasized by scholars, and rightly so, I think, uh, the idea of a move towards the rule of law i.e. that there is a limit to what an assembly, any given uh, popular assembly, can decide ad hoc, which in the fifth century it seems they could make. Some of them just have to stand up and say, uh, let's go and uh, let's go and tax Syracuse or Carthage. And if enough people said yes, then they would just go and do it. No, we'd have to. Uh, in the fourth century, there are all kinds of procedures in place to, to limit that scope for, for ad hoc um, and impromptu action. Um, and there are lots of laws in place uh, we see that, um, for example, in a, a large number of prosecutions for making illegal proposals. Somebody stands up in the assembly, makes a proposal, they immediately get sued by someone else who says, the law doesn't allow you to make that proposal in that assembly at that time. Um, and so that could be seen as a sort of regressive step and move away from democracy. But on the other hand, it seems to be a pretty key factor uh, in limiting the scope for the, uh, the, the extremes of, uh, of populism. And Athens in the fourth century, until the Macedonians come, uh, come along and, uh, and conquer the place, uh, really is a very stable democratic regime. No more threats of coups, no more overthrows. It's uh, democracy all the way. Thank you. So our next speaker is Patrick Angela, who is an expert on Europe and the Islamic world in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, particularly um, internal conflict um, and urban history. Welcome to those who are still here. Um, it's my task to move us on in time, but it's actually a topic which is not a million miles from what Hans was talking about, which is the politics of um, cities. Um, 
My idea really is to look at cities and populism in the context of the medieval evidence. The Middle Ages are an interesting um, uh, uh, period to look at this topic because this is a period which sees sort of the greatest push of urbanization um, between antiquity and industrialization. It happens roughly between 900 and 1300 in Europe and the Mediterranean world. And it's in this period that we see a lot of participatory politics, um, in many ways of the kind that Hans described for archaic sort of classical Greece. What do I mean by participatory politics? Well, really what it says on the tin, large or relatively large numbers of city dwellers taking part in the politics of their cities. Now, the most um, famous uh, example is, of course, Italy, which will be familiar to many of you, the Italian city-states, which were governed by communes. Florence is, of course, a famous example here, where limited, but nevertheless, relatively sizable numbers of the urban population participate in the governance of the city through the councils and assemblies of the commune, which would have been in the very palace um, that you can see there, the Palazzo Vecchio of Florence. Um, I'll mainly be talking about Italy, um, but it is worth saying this is true for other regions as well. Um, the Low Countries would be a very good example. Cities like Bruges, which had a very strong um, guild movement, so strong that in the late 15th century, the inhabitants of Bruges were able to imprison the Holy Roman Emperor for about three months. Um, also, the Islamic world is a place where you get participatory politics. Famously, in a city like Damascus, the Umayyad Mosque, which you can see there, plays a very important part um, in the sort of civic identity um, of Damascus. But as I say, my focus really will be on Italy. And what I want us to think about is how does populism relate to this participatory politics that you get in these cities? And there are really two phenomena that I think we would today associate with populism that are also very much visible and in the cities that uh, I'm working on. One is the rise of strongmen, and the other is the prominence which urban revolts played in the politics of these cities. And the broader argument that I'm trying to make is that um, these phenomena were sort of part and parcel of the political setup of these cities. It came with the participatory politics. It came with the communes um, that you get in Italy. So let's have a look at strongmen, um, first of all. And um, it's uh, depressing to say, but it is broadly true that in most cities um, of Italy, we get the rise of strongmen that end up supplanting many of the more collective institutions um, that Italy is so famous for. And it's enough uh, for you to uh, go to a, a, a quite a large um, uh, range of Italian cities, which will have castles in the city or at the edge of the city built by these strongmen. And they are really, these castles are really the personifications of a development that you get in Italy between around 1200 and 1450, which colleagues of mine have counted there are around 400 different strongmen that rise in the various cities um, of Italy. These strongmen would often then be in charge of military operations, fiscal collections, and so on. There has been a lot of recent interest in these strongmen, and um, our view of them has changed in the wake of the research that has been done. Um, because it, it used to be said, people thought, okay, first, first we get a period of participatory politics. First we had colleges and assemblies and so on, and then that breaks down and it gives rise to these strongmen. Now the thinking is different. Now the thinking is that the participatory politics of the communes exist really alongside these strongmen. Right? I'll show you one example, uh, which I think illustrates it very neatly, uh, which is Verona, uh, known for many of us, to many of us really through the factions in Shakespeare, but really in the Middle Ages, they were best, Verona was best known for the lords that end up ruling this city between 1260 and 1387, the Della Scala family, hosts of Dante. Um, they ended up ruling this city, dominating it militarily, from the castle, the Castel Vecchio, which they built at the edge of the city. 
Um, the fact that it's at the edge of the city already shows us that relations were not always straightforward. In fact, you can see they built themselves very conveniently a bridge over the Adige River just to escape if things were going to go wrong. But on the other hand, they were also really very much entrenched in city politics. They came to power in the 1260s on the back of a popular coalition because they championed a new elite which was on the rise in Verona at this time, and they pushed themselves to power through that coalition. At this point, Verona was ruled through a commune, so through assemblies and councils, which would be meeting in the Palazzo del Comune, which you can visit still today if you go to Verona. But very interestingly, the Della Scala did not do away with the commune. It did not do away with the assemblies and the council. They left them in place, but tried to manipulate them from within. And what the De La Scala managed to do from 1277 onwards is to get the assemblies that would be meeting in this palace to vote them sometimes lifelong powers uh, to um, effectively act as the lords of the city. Uh, but very interestingly, these would often be limited to the lifetime of one ruler. And when the ruler died, they would seek, need to seek that approval again after that. Only from 1357 onwards were the De La Scala able to rule on a permanent and hereditary basis. Permanent, nothing is permanent in these cities, 1387, and they are swept away by the conquest of Milan. Um, and just to show you how the De La Scala managed to sort of insert themselves into the existing politics of Verona, um, you can see the city center of Verona there. Um, uh, those of you who know, this is Piazza dell'Erba. Here is the palace of the commune, which you saw just earlier. And the De La Scala um, very conveniently end up building themselves palaces right next to it. So they are planting themselves right next to the institutions of the commune. You can see here one such palace known as Palazzo di, di Can Grande, which is one of the De La Scala lords. And they even built themselves a very lavish tomb complex right opposite, which would be here. So you can see that the La Scala are very much hugging, and perhaps hugging in a lethal way, the existing channels of the commune of Verona. And you end up with this very strange concoction where participatory politics continues to exist alongside the rule of these strongmen. This is the way most Italian cities go in this period. We know Italian cities because they are city republics, but really this is the trend most of them take. And this is to an extent even true for Florence. Florence is known as a city republic. It's ruled by a regime called the Priorate of the Guilds from 1293 to 1530. That's an awful long time for a very turbulent period. Um, we think that at the beginning of this period, around a third of the male working population of Florence had access to various collective councils in the city. And yet a lot of the recent research has shown that Florence too did not escape this trend towards strongmen. Very famous, and uh, you won't need me to tell you for the 15th century of the Medici. We, the Medici never held any formal office in Florence in the 15th century. We know that they were operating behind the scenes. We can reconstruct this through a very extensive corpus of letters um, that survives. And many of you will, of course, know Lorenzo de' Medici um, as one example. But the recent research has shown that even prior to the Medici, so prior to 1434, which is when the first um, sort of Medici period begins, you get various periods of experiments with strongmen. One example here, and I'll tell you more about him in a second, is a lord that is called in from southern Italy called Walter of Brienne. He is even made general lord, dominus generalis, of Florence between 1342 and 1343. And he himself turns himself sort of into a demagogic leader in Florence. He's initially called in by the elite, but he ends up courting the wool workers of the city of Florence. So in other words, this a picture we now have of Italian city-states is that um, strongmen and participatory politics go together. Uh, there is no such thing as a strongman without participatory politics. Strongmen always seem to involve various elements of the city, uh, often of the communes in their rule. 
the reverse is also true. There is no such thing as participatory politics without a strongman. Uh, participatory politics always seems to eventually end up in that corner. And very closely connected to this is the fact that you get a lot of urban revolts. So if um, strongmen are one phenomenon of populism that you get in these cities, the other is urban revolts, by which I mean um, revolts driven by coalitions, often involving popular elements in the city, um, involving violence and bringing down existing regimes. And these revolts often happen on the back of an understanding that there were legitimate ways to bring down governments if governments, for example, acted against the interests of justice. Um, and these were established theories of resistance that rebels very, very frequently drew on. Now, with all these strongmen around, you won't be surprised that many of them found themselves under attack in urban revolts. And one example for this is the man I last mentioned, Walter of Brienne. Walter of Brienne ends up being so hated in Florence because he ends up uh, having this uh, deal with the wool workers that no less, no fewer than three separate conspiracies brought him down only a year after uh, he was made general lord of the city. And we are lucky because we have a surviving fresco, which was probably commissioned by the regime which followed, which tried to justify this revolt. And um, what you can see there in the corner is our man, Walter of Brienne, leaving the city in shame while he is being um, thrown out by uh, a figure with which there is quite a lot of debate what that figure is. Perhaps it's a virtue of constancy. We don't really know. But presiding over all this is St. Anne, because this happens on the 26th of July, 1343, feast day of St. Anne, and you can see her there holding her protective hand over the city palace of Florence, still looks like that. And the other hand rewards a series of soldiers, or presumably the people that are standing up for the city. And very interestingly is what's going on on the floor here. Um, this is the coats of arms of Walter, which has been broken. And these are the symbols of justice which were smashed under his rule. Here we've got a sword, very frequently used as a symbol of justice. Another symbol of justice here are scales, also broken up, and this is presumably a law book. The message is clear. If you act against justice, revolt can be evoked as a corrective mechanism. And this is the fate that many lords up and down Italy meet. And I said, well, if you go to Italian cities, you will still see some of the citadels of these lords. Well, that's only if they haven't been destroyed in revolts. Because one of the things that happens very frequently is that rebels unleash their wrath precisely against the citadels I was just talking about. Very famous case is the Castello Sfortesco in Milan. You can visit it today. They will tell you that Leonardo da Vinci worked there and did wonders. The truth is also that this is a construction which was made from the 1450s onwards because the previous task was destroyed in an urban revolt when the dynasty of Milan, which the people of Milan weren't very happy, and they torched down um, uh, the castle, um, making all these sort unhappy forever because they also destroyed all the archives that were um, uh, in that same castle. You want to see a destroyed castle? You're welcome to go to Bologna, uh, not far from the train station. Um, is the Castello di Porta Galliera. This is a citadel which was put up in, um, was people tried to, governors of Bologna tried to put up in Bologna five times between 1330 and 1506, and five times it was destroyed by rebels. And we've got the accounts of Bologna, and we know that the rebels sometimes employed the same engineers that were used to build the castle to then take it down again. No longer Machiavelli said, do not build fortresses if you want to be a successful ruler. You will just attract the wrath of your people. And this is, of course, true if we leave Italy as well. Um, if you have a chance this summer to go to Morocco, to Fez, and you uh, manage to uh, uh, visit this charming uh, Caspa, the Caspa Noir, this was the governor's mansion of Fez, destroyed in 1248 in an uprising which so scared the Sultan of Morocco that he chose to leave Fez 
30 years later and built himself a new palace city just outside Fez, which by the way is still where the sultans of Morocco reside to this day. And then there is, of course, a certain urban castle known as the Bastille, built actually in the Middle Ages, in the, in the 14th century, destroyed twice in 1382 and 1413 in uprisings in the Middle Ages. And then, of course, it was destroyed once more in that ultimate uh, show of populism called the French Revolution. So you can see we are going full circle here. Rise of strongmen and populism uh, go together and revolts are really, um, in many ways, the mechanism that makes that whole system work because revolts act as corrective mechanisms when everything uh, goes wrong. What am I trying to say? This is really my final uh, few sentences. Um, I think we have a tendency sometimes to think that participatory politics is here and then um, strongman or violence in the street is over there. But actually, they are closely linked. The rise of strongman, revolts, these are not aberrations, these are accidents. They are in the DNA of the participatory politics that we get in these Italian cities. And there are two, I think, uncomfortable truths to take away from this. The first, I think, is that participatory politics is messy. I think we sometimes have a tendency to think that participatory, dare I say democratic politics, um, is somehow more stable. People say we should export democracy to this or that countries. We need to bring stability. Well, this evidence here suggests that actually, um, whenever you get popular participation, you also get the other phenomena, and it can be rather messy. The second um, uncomfortable thought is really where this leaves sort of the grand sweep of history. Um, there used to be a, a, a tradition, particularly in American universities, you wouldn't have been taught such things here in UCL, of course, um, that saw Italian city states as the antecedent of modernity. You can see where this is coming from. Here we get republics. And these republics would one day lead to modern democracy. There were courses in American universities known as Western civilization, short Western civ courses that, that did this uh, very regularly and until very recently. Now, of course, that's something we find very difficult to square with the evidence we see here. Uh, uh, you know, these communes always coexisted with strong men, they always coexisted with revolts in a way that sort of sits uneasily with um, what modern democracy looks like, or maybe what we think it should look like. Because of course, the last chapter of modern democracy has not been. And um, the medieval evidence that we've seen might perhaps make us think carefully about where our own democracies are moving next, because um, the populism that we've seen has certain uh, um, advantages, arguably, um, but it also brings certain challenges, and um, that's perhaps some should give us some pause for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker is Professor Jones, who works on modern uh, European history and war cultures between 1880 and 1945. So what I want to do this evening's final talk is talk a little bit about the British monarchy and populism in the First World War. Um, total War, the First World War, presented many challenges for the monarchy in Britain, one of which was the danger of populism from within society, both the left and the right. And the war mobilized ordinary people, it mobilized married ideologies, particularly as it went on, nationalism, but also uh, revolutionary ideologies too, uh, all across Europe. And this was a challenge. Um, but the war also required the mobilization of ordinary people to support the conflict. And in this, the monarchy became a tool to, to mobilize, to create national loyalties, uh, and in a way, to kind of generate popular support for the conflict as well. And this was very dangerous for the monarchy because it risked associating it with conflict, which if Britain lost the war, the monarchy would then be tainted by that. There was the problem of populism from within. Uh, but there was also a problem for the monarchy as well during the war. And that as it, as it went on, it needed to show itself to be aligned with ordinary people and not with elites. So if we understand populism in terms of ordinary people against elites, at the monarchy of fate, during the war, as people are, are mobilized in, in populist ways, through propaganda, through nationalism, it faced having to navigate that. 
um, and, and, and cut a, a, a difficult course. Um, and it, it had to make sure it was always seen as allied with ordinary people and not with the elites of British society. And, and to do this, it had to itself adopt some populist outreach measures to the public uh, to open up the monarchy and make it show how much it cared and was involved with the interests of ordinary people. And this was in a way to draw on a longer tradition of monarchy it always had. Uh, the monarchy had always seen itself as above politics um, and it had always seen itself as in a direct relationship with the ordinary subject. The king saw himself uh, as, as a, uh, in, in a transcendent relationship with each individual subject at a time when many working class men did not have the vote, uh, not to mention uh, uh, women uh, not having the vote. And so the link between king and subject was itself a kind of uh, special relationship, if you like, at the heart of how the British state operated. Um, and so this, this relationship with ordinary people was always there before 1914. This is something they then turned uh, to mobilize uh, as, the, as the war went on and to really develop even further. So the monarchy was never, before the war, only about the elite. But as the war went on and, and released these populist tendencies, um, it then had to make sure it was seen as being on the side of ordinary people. What I want to do in this evening's uh, brief talk is I want, first of all, to talk about the threat of populism from within for the Mark from the right and also from the left. Then I want to talk about this question of how the monarchy itself mobilized populist gestures and outreach uh, mechanisms uh, to try and associate itself with ordinary people. And I want to emphasize that that whole process was actually trying to use populist gestures uh, as a way of actually um, maintaining the monarchy's position within society, uh, maintaining uh, it, it, its power, um, and ensuring that the types of war nationalism, populist nationalism that the war generated, were utilized uh, in, in, in favor of actually keeping at the monarchy. This brings me to my first slide. A lot of this is drawn on my recent book from 2021, For King and Country, British monarchy and the First World War. And the monarchy during the war has actually been really largely neglected as an academic subject. In fact, that's actually true for the 20th century British monarchy as a whole. And if we think of the fact that some 3 million people went into London in 1953 for Queen Elizabeth II's coronation, and there's only one uh, decent academic article on that entire phenomenon, uh, you can get a sense of the gap in terms of our studying of, of popular monarchism in British society. It's a really big gap. And this book is really looking at what is this question, kind of popular monarchism in total war? What happens to monarchism when it meets total war at the, at the, at the opening era of mass democracy in the 20th century? And, and, what, and, and how, does, how does the monarchy man, navigate that and end up, uh, end up ultimately on the winning side? So to begin, what was this threat of, of populism from within, the wartime political threat of populism from within? I put up Three key figures there uh, that represent this threat in different ways. There's always a threat for a king of being upstaged by the prime minister. And this is also true, for, obviously, for queens as well. Uh, when, 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 when it's the case of Britain having having a queen as monarch uh, in the First World War, the king was George V. And he was quite a gruff man. Uh, he wasn't a very charismatic personality. Um, and in, 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 in the middle of the war, um, a new prime minister comes in, uh, replaces the rather, um, rather disorganized uh, Herbert, uh, Herbert Asquith, um, and he's a very charismatic figure, uh, David Lloyd George. He's the first figure on the end there. Um, David Lloyd George uh, was brought in to win the war. He'd organized Ministry for Munitions. He was very effective, a great public speaker. Um, and very popular. And this, this actually raised a lot of concerns about the fact that the, the, the risk he might pose to the political system. Uh, within the palace, palace advisors were muttering that he might, he might become a dictator. If, the, if they won the war, he might go on to, uh, to, to, to dismantle uh, the existing system. There were real fears that he might you know, potentially become a British Mussolini, actually, within the palace. Now, Lloyd George actually was none of, the, none, none, none of those things. Um, he was a Democrat. He was a uh, non-conformist uh, Welsh background, uh, famously rose from quite an impoverished background to the top of, of society, resented entrenched elite, uh, elite uh, privilege. Uh, and this is why he raised hackles uh, at the palace. And uh, to some extent, some of his behavior was misinterpreted. He didn't have much time for flummery. Uh, he didn't have a huge amount of respect for George V as a person, but he actually believed Britain should remain a monarchy and was quite monarchist in his views, particularly of the monarch emperor as holding the British empire together. 
So he wasn't really a, a threatening, threatening dictator figure. But this, is, this was the threat of populism from within. So there was a lot of concern about keeping Lloyd George in his box, not allowing him to become a populist demagogue during the war at the palace. If we compare it with the Second World War, we can see the reasons why that might be the case. In the Second World War, Winston Churchill really does overshadow George VI. And more people are listening to Churchill's speeches on the radio by far than are listening to George VI's speeches uh, as the war goes on. So uh, in, in World War I, uh, the monarchy does a better job of, of ensuring that it is, it, it is George V who remains the, the, the symbol, if you like, uh, of, of, of state and nation. But it's also important for political reasons. Uh, during the war, there's too much legislation to get through Parliament by conventional means. So they turn to the Privy Council and they rush legislation through that way, uh, with Privy Councillors and the King passing legislation on everything from uh, the wartime blockade of Germany uh, right through to, to, to rules about uh, uh, rules about rules about rations. Uh, this is all going through, through the, the royal prerogative, effectively, and not through Parliament and not being debated in Parliament. So the, 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 mon the, the monarchy is, is 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 very important in a kind of wartime political power mechanism. And, and hence, again, uh, the need to make sure that that system uh, works and returns to democracy after the war, uh, which, uh, which is something that ultimately, um, between them, Lloyd George and George V, ensure actually happens. And the second figure here is Douglas Haig. Uh, Douglas Haig becomes commander in chief of the British army during the war in France. Uh, he replaces Sir John French. Um, Haig, Haig um, comes in and, and, uh, after a very, very poor commander in chief. Uh, so, so John French. So um, it's not too difficult for him to win uh, the support uh, of George V and, and the palace because the, pre the, the previous incumbent had been so bad. Um, but Haig also has an advantage with his wife in the lady in waiting. And so he has, he, through her, he gets very, very close to the king and queen to the extent he's actually sending his diaries over regularly from the front so that the king can read his diaries to check up on how the war is going and to check up on what's happening to what the king sees as his armies. He refers to them always to his armies. Remember, the king is the commander-in-chief. He delegates that power by British convention to a commander-in-chief in the field. So Haig holds his position by virtue of the monarch. There's a real risk again, charismatic general. We've seen it through history. A charismatic general might come in, raise the populist masses, take over. Uh, but in this case, uh, that doesn't happen. Haig himself is a true and true monarchist um, and actually uses the king to ensure he maintains his position. Lord George detests Haig. I've put them close together on this PowerPoint slide. They probably wouldn't be happy about that. They really hated each other. And, 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 and in 1917, Lord George tries to actually get Haig put under a French general. He tries to put the British army under French, under ultimate French command, uh, which actually is what happens in 1918. That's the final way they win the war. They put the whole set of British armies under Ferdinand Foch. Uh, but in 1917, Haig protests the king and it gets, it, it gets stopped. And he protests that, that, that Lloyd George is trying to put the king's armies under control of the French. Um, in 1918, they create a kind of uh, generalissimo system so that Haig has, has local control, but that actually ultimately the, the strategic decisions are being taken by Foch. And finally, the, the threat uh, from within here, and the final one is uh, Horatio, uh, sorry, Horatio Bottomley, um, less well known figure, right wing wartime populist, xenophobe, um, and editor of the radical right wing newspaper, uh, John Bull. In 1915, uh, he tries to rabble rouse against, uh, against the, the, the king and, and the palace because they still have German, uh, German, order, uh, German members of the Order of the Garters, banners still hanging in uh, St. George's Chapel at Windsor. And he tries to raise populist uh, uh, disapproval of that. He succeeds to some extent, and those, those banners are taken down. Uh, George V is very reluctant to, to um, generate hatred against individual Germans during the war. He blamed the Kaiser for the war. He didn't like the idea of widespread wartime xenophobia at all. Um, and found it very difficult, um, but they, they, the, the palace has to react to this, uh, to this action by Bottomley. Um, later on in uh, 1917, in July, um, Bottomley um, addresses a meeting of the Imperial Defence Union, uh, who are meeting in central London, and um, difficult moments. London has just experienced uh, ex uh, uh, hundreds of casualties in a, in a German air raid for the first time uh, in the East End. A primary school has been bombed, a class of infant children has been killed. Um, and this meeting meets uh, to call for the king to assume more power. They want, uh, they want the king to actually take over the democratic system. Uh, and Bottomley makes a speech, he addresses the audience and says, what is the good of a king if he does not rule? And he suggests that in the future, he hopes to see a day when, when uh, they will march on Buckingham Palace. Now, when the audience shout back and say, let's go tonight, um, Bottomley uh, then retracts and says, actually, well, the king and queen aren't here, they're, they're in France. And um, so, so, so he's not quite so keen actually doing it, uh, but he's very much a populist rabble rouser. Uh, and he talks about telling the king that he must rule or we must. 
And so this is again a threat, and, and the palace always has an eye to this kind of right wing populist figure uh, during the war and trying to be careful of that. Also, from within, um, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, um, William Robertson, um, he was also pushing for the king to take on more executive powers. He thinks there should be a stronger, more autocratic British monarchy, uh, and is again making those noises in February 1918. And the palace is keen to preserve uh, democracy. In fact, it becomes more democratic as the war goes on, more in favor of the existing constitution than it had been before 1914. And, and George V uh, particularly uh, starts to start to move towards the idea of accepting women's suffrage, for example, in exchange for women's war work, and, 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 and really seeing the benefits of the British constitutional system as a way of preserving uh, the monarchy uh, 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 through, through revolutionary and turbulent times. Uh, so very much uh, supporting kind of extension of suffrage uh, and not going for the idea of an autocratic monarchy. Now, what of populism from the left from within? This is um, three, 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 three issues here that crop up uh, in 1917. So, Bizarrely, in Britain until 1917, you don't really have much in the press or discussion or public debate about the fact that the British royals are of German descent and that the king is actually a cousin of the Kaiser. And um, there's a lot of emphasis on the Kaiser, the tyrant king. Um, but it's always, it's always obfuscated that he's actually very closely related uh, to the British royal family. And this changes with the February Revolution in Russia. Suddenly a space opens up. Suddenly the inconceivable has happened. And a European dynasty has been overthrown in war. This was not uh, this was not anticipated in Britain, and it opens up a public space for debate. And so, figures from the radical left start really openly discussing um, the, the fact that actually many European countries are governed by tyrannical monarchies, and that perhaps it might be uh, the future is going to be a different kind of state or more republics. They always stop short, though, of criticizing their own monarchy. So, a lot of the newspaper press before it goes along the lines of. You know, tyrants in Russia, tyrants in Germany, and um, but our own good old King George, he's wonderful, he's constitutional, we like him, he's doing a great job with all this war work. Um, but yes, no, let's reform European continental monarchy. So it's almost like coming at an oblique angle, very, very little direct criticism, perhaps to get around the censor, perhaps because the king actually is very, very popular, and they know that readership falls if you criticize uh, George V. That happened to the Daily Herald, it lost lots of readers at the start of the war, it never did it again. And um, so this space opens up, and what, what really alarms the palace is H.G. Wells, who's the figure on the far side there, writes a letter to the Times. He's a very famous science fiction writer. And in April 1917, he writes a letter to the Times in this moment of discussion about monarchies in Europe. Um, and he calls for the formation of a Republican society in Britain. And this is in the Times, and the Times publishes it. Now, this sends shockwaves through the palace and the advisors because it's the Times, it's the bastion of, of, of what they see as, 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 as monarchism. And it publishes this, uh, this letter. Now, it publishes it actually on the other page with a massive long article about why the British monarchy is wonderful and why Wales is wrong. But nobody ever remembers that or notes that in the palace. They just panic when they see this, this statement. And, and so this space opens up, this debate starts to open up. And what opens up as well is discussion about the Germanic origins of the monarchy. And that is what prompts the very rapid name change in the summer of 1970, the switch to the name of Windsor from the German name. Um, they, they switch in almost before the discourse can take off and, and the debate can go any further. Preemptively, they switch. Uh, and it's a very populist gesture, picking a popular name, Windsor, and that gets them out of, out of difficulty. And um, the middle piece is, the middle article is from the Workers and Soldiers Council, uh, which was a, a, meet, a radical meeting of, of um, of, of, of left-wing groups uh, in Leeds. Um, they do have some anti-monarchist speakers, but really it's only, it's, it's only a handful. Um, most of the discussion is about, um, about socialism in, in Britain. It's, 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 it's really not both. Mon mon monarchy republicanism isn't really the focus of the debate here at all. But again, this sends huge shockwaves uh, through, 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 uh, through, through the palace. And then finally, obviously, the Bolshevik Revolution in the autumn, which again causes real panic. So you get this populist, um, anti monarchism fear at, at, in the palace. It's more a fear than a reality. When I actually looked into this in detail, um, because I'm from Ireland, so I was looking for visible anti monarchism. You know, are they blowing up statues? Are they knocking down? Are they booing the, booing the cinema reels of the king and queen? Are they, you know, burning flags? None of this is happening. Okay. In fact, what I discovered was cabinet minutes from May 1970, so just before this event in June, uh, where the cabinet is having problems because of striking workers in the north of England and in Scotland. Um, and the cabinet knows Lloyd George is incredibly unpopular up there, so they can't send Lloyd George to fix the problem. Now, there's conveniently a royal tour already planned for the shipyards and the industrial areas of north England. And so they, they, they discuss in cabinet how this must go ahead and how at each stop, the king must meet with the trade union leaders face-to-face, one-to-one. And so they get the Labour uh, member, a member of the cabinet to arrange this. 
the king and queen go north to great acclaim. Um, the king meets one-to-one -one with some of the leaders of the striking groups. Uh, it all goes really well. Um, and it's inconceivable that the Tsar or the Kaiser would have been sent in similar circumstances to munitions factories and shipyards at a time of mass strikes to try and calm things down. So I don't think Britain was on the brink of revolution, given the, 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 this, given the cabinet actually thinks the monarchy is a safer bet than their own prime minister. So it's a fear of populism from within, but it leads the monarchy to do new things. And um, so they're fearful of right-wing, left-wing populism. They want to preserve the system they've got. They want to preserve Britain's constitutional democracy. How do they do it? Well, they adopt a lot of populist outreach gestures during the war. One of the most famous ones is the Princess Mary gift box. Um, in 1914, Princess Mary, eldest daughter of George V and Queen Mary, um, issues an appeal in the national press for donations to send a Christmas gift to every ser serving soldier and sailor. And eventually it's also extended also to, 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 to nurses and to female personnel. Um, who are serving, uh, serving, serving, serving in, in the forces. And um, this seems like a great idea. The war's only started, you know, it'll all be over quite soon. And this is a nice idea, send a gift to everybody. They end up sending 2.6 million of these things because the war obviously doesn't uh, end early. It goes on for years and years. And many people only get their box for Christmas 20, Christmas 19, 1915 or Christmas 1916. The army is horrified uh, because ultimately ends up clogging up their supply lines and also uses up an awful lot of brass which you need in wartime. Uh, but either way, soldiers love these. And some of them write back talking about how the bullet was deflected by the gift box they had in their breast pocket. And Princess Mary, you know, Mary, miraculous. All, there's lots of, lots of ways in which this becomes a really popular gesture. People keep them. They talk about how they pass them on their families. They write thank you notes to the palace. It goes very well. Another set of outreach gestures. And Princess Mary herself there in, in the Red Cross uniform becomes a nurse. That is her mother, Queen Mary. And Princess Mary becomes a nurse in a children's hospital, okay? Very clever. So the Tsarina and her daughters had gone to nurse soldiers and actually that had gone down really badly. They were getting into contact with lots of soldiers' bodies and it was seen as kind of a bit too, uh, they lacked decorum, a bit too sexualized, getting close to, to naked men who were being washed, etc. It goes down really badly with the Russian public. They don't really want to see their kind of majestic and mysterious queen and, and, and princesses doing that, doing that kind of work. It's dirty, it's grubby, it's associated with kind of and, and manual labor. The British royal family doesn't quite know what to do. They want to do some kind of show of, show of gesture. Um, and so ultimately she nurses in a children's hospital, which seems a bit safer. Nobody could object to that. And yet it's still dangerous because there's contagious disease, uh, which in this period, many of which could not be fixed, could not be solved. Um, and indeed, um, there's also the risk of air raids. So it's, 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 it, it again goes down very well. And um, likewise, the king um, gives out lots and lots of medals during the war, uh, 50,000 medals he distributes with his own hands. Um, and they launch, for example, lots of new, um, uh, 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 new, new honours. So um, one of the honours they launch is the OBE, which is created for civilians in 1917. So the king can now give medals to munition workers overalls, which he does. Uh, and sometimes in mass rallies in the north of England where people come into Scabia and he pins on the medal um, onto munition at sturdy overalls as they go up and they, you know, they, 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 they all get their moment. Um, and, and again, this is photograph, this creates lots of populist outreach, goes down really very, very well with ordinary members of the public. They also get invited to the palace. They start having ceremonies outside so they can get cram more people in. Um, and he goes to France six times as well to visit uh, the soldiers. Um, and, to, and, to, and to be present and again uh, distribute medals and see, you know, visit the wounded in hospitals as well. They, they spend a lot of time doing, doing that, sometimes three, four hospitals a day. And, and so, so, so these kinds of outreach gestures help to, to, help to bring, 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 a, bring a new image of the monarchy. Again, they're very, they're very popular. They are adopting populist measures from outside. They do far more newsreel footage than they would have done before the war. They're constantly in the news. And here's a tea party at Buckingham Palace. These, uh, these, these, these um, start in 1916, where wounded and um, recuperating wounded are brought into Buckingham Palace and they're served tea by the royal family, hundreds of them. And the members of the royal family and the elites go around serving them tea, giving them cake, and um, hosting kind of uh, dramatics for them, etc. Um, and, and, and letting them go around the gardens and, and enjoy the gardens. Um, and so this is part of a bigger process whereby you see the women of the royal family going out and serving tea. And, and, and sandwiches in various places. They go to London Bridge Station, for example, and they serve returning prisoners of war, tea and sandwiches uh, behind a tea urn. Queen Mary turns up behind a tea urn in Stepney after an air raid, uh, serving again sandwiches and tea. And, and it, it sounds like, sounds kind of mediocre, but this is an era in which these, these, these people are seen as incredibly 
um, um, important national symbols. And so to you know, people, people kind of shake as they get the sandwich. The accounts are really interesting. People shake as they get the sandwich from the hands of Queen Mary. It, it's all, so for some people, it's all a bit too, a bit too much, even though they're, they're, they're overwhelmed by it. But it's a very clever, again, kind of populism uh, outreach. But what I want to end with is this idea that it's not just about uh, utilizing the tools of populist politics to make the monarchy more attractive in more time and to mobilize ordinary people for more time. It's also about an underlying process of sacralization monarchy that has longer roots in British society and that goes on through and after the war. And we see this most clearly with war commemoration of the dead. So with the burial of the unknown soldier painted here, um, it's very painting my Salisbury. Um, this, is, this image shows the chief mourner of the burial of the unknown soldier is King George V. Um, he, he and his family are mourning the, the, the fallen um, soldier, nobody knows who the body of our soldier is. It could be anyone from anywhere across the British Empire. Of course, the British, the island of Britain. And this, this, this figure is then buried as if he was a king. And if you look at the actual, the actual tomb, it said they buried him among the kings. So they use they use the sacralization of monarchy to honor the symbol of the dead of the war while in turn that symbol of the glorified war dead then reflects glory back on the monarchy as well. So it becomes this kind of symbiotic relationship. And, and so there's more than just populism going on here, I would argue. There's also sacralization. This is an era in which the, the role of the monarch as governor of the Church of England really matters. The monarch as anointed through coronation, different to other, uh, other humans. Uh, this, there is still a very strong belief in a lot of these, uh, these aspects of sacralized monarchy amongst the general population. Um, so it's both populism, but it's also sacralization operating in symbiosis. And if we think about the idea of what it meant to be British in this period, the definition of British nationality was to be a British subject of the monarch. There was no other definition. That was your nationality. There was no separate nationality in Canada, Australia, Ireland, Britain. Everybody, by definition, your nationality was British subject. That was what was on your, when you got your first passport, because they came in with World War I, that was what was on it. A British subject of the monarch. Your entire relationship with Britishness was monarchism. That's what defined it. And so this idea of, of monarchy, monarchy adopting some of those aspects of populism, trying to deal with populist threats from within by kind of taking some of their tactics and using them, uh, uh, using kind of outreach tactics in other ways to win and to show, um, it constantly show, to show that they understood the, the experiences of the ordinary people and they with the ordinary people and it was also a process of sacralization as well. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Those who are really talking about interesting question, um, talks, we can have questions on individual talks or general questions. Yes. Sorry, yes. I, me. Um, I, I, I apologize. I, I don't think I quite got the question. Well, I, 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 yeah. All right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. No. I, 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 of course. Absolutely. Yes. You no. Know, that was uh, really certainly part of my my, my point <laughs> that uh, some of the similarities are uh, are quite striking. Um, Though on the other hand, I just wanted to, the other part of my point was to uh, suggest that although I would, uh, you know, I can see no uh, argument for Nigel Farage or Donald Trump or Boris Johnson, uh, that actually it, it's a sort of more or less like, like Patrick's point about, you know, how, how messy democracy can be, that I could see that uh, quite similar looking things um, did have a, you know, a useful and important role to, to play in, in Athens, you know, at the time. So um, 
I totally agree with the with the, with the, the parallels, but um, but equally I wanted to to complicate matters a bit by saying you know, it looks similar, but it may not be uh, all all as bad as we uh, as we came to think of this. Yes. I'm backing up on the last question and asking to speculate what might have happened in terms of the monarchy's relationship with the nation and the opportunity if everybody had not had We have had um, a rather pro deal in the strong popular tendency in charge. If they just feel a speculation, where am I going to get the monarchy? That's a great question. Obviously, I mean, we're not really allowed to do counterfactual history, but hey, I'll try anyway. Um, so, so I think that one of the things about Edward VIII was he hated the job of being a king. And he talked about that, about the job. I hate the job. I hate the nature of the job. Um, so I think it, 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 it's possible that he would have delegated powers quite substantially to a, to, to a political figure or political leader rather than trying to go it alone as the charismatic political leader himself. I don't see him as someone who would have put in enough hours to have been the autocrat himself, um, but he toys with it in the 30s. And he's, some of his ideas about charisma and leadership when he talks to his father before he becomes king are going down that line. He's also very influenced by Americanism and this idea of a kind of um, a new world um, of, 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 of sort of showbiz uh, monarchy, celebrity monarchy. Um, he had himself been quite traumatized by his own experiences in the First World War um, and is supported by the veterans. So he does actually follow a lot of the model of a figure who could, you know, a kind of classic interwar European potential dictator figure. And um, the veterans love him because during the war he had a safe staff officer job and he had actually gone deliberately to seek out danger, gone to the most dangerous parts of the front line, got himself under shell fire um, as part of showing solidarity with them and also to prove his masculinity. And that had actually really endeared him to them. So there were a lot of veterans really supported him and were very upset at the abdication. Um, so there is this, you know, there's this really difficult phase where George VI comes in, he's hardly known at all. Edward VIII is still floating around. Um, when the war breaks out, they have to give him a job in France. They have to kind of keep him on side. Um, and they're really worried he's going to overshadow uh, George VI. And it's only when he flees uh, the, 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 the German invasion and, it, and, and really behaves very badly during that, he basically kind of ditches and runs, um, that, that he loses the support of, of, of many of those veterans who, who had liked him so much. So there was, definitely a, there was definitely potential for him to follow that line of becoming some kind of more autocratic monarch, but he would never have put in the hours. He would have just been the kind of the showbiz figurehead for somebody else, I think. Yeah, thank you. It's a good question. It's a really important one. Yes. Okay, so, so in terms of the the popularity of the royals outside of Britain during the war, it sort of varies as to who you are and where you are. And um, there, there's there's a belief actually amongst many, many populations that are discriminated against on the grounds of local race based legislation um, that the monarchy um, is sort of their advocate. So going into the war, there are there, there are some groups, for example, uh, uh, educated black groups in South Africa who think that, that that if they appeal to the monarchy, they may get more rights. Uh, and if they serve king and country, as it were, through the war, they may get more rights out of this and that the monarchy is actually more neutral and uh, more of a neutral arbiter than, than other groups. Um, in contrast, there are some groups like French Canadians, white French Canadians who don't want anything to do with the British monarchy and who really resent it, um, Irish Australians as well. So it's a really mixed picture. There is no one kind of one, one trajectory fits all. Um, but at the end of the war, um, the, the, the British monarchy is still um, you know, head of state of, of, of these different parts of the empire. And the empire actually doesn't, it starts the process of reforming in the twenties by delegating political power from London, but maintaining um, the, 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 um, the imperial symbolic power uh, with Windsor. So there's, they, there's a very clear decision made by many of the colonial office figures and the palace that actually you can cut loose politically Australia and Canada. You can allow them to get their own independent foreign policy, for example, and the Balfour Declaration of 26. They can get more, more power, but 
what must not be negotiated is the role of the British um, monarch as, 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 as emperor and, that, and as head of state. Um, so that idea of a monarchical system holding it all together while the political elements, well, they get more political independence, but they keep the cultural monarchy tie with Britain. That's the model. And that model actually succeeds right through, it continues even after the Second World War. That's what the Commonwealth ultimately becomes. Um, so it's kind of, it's that, that's, that's, that's the, the twin track approach is what they choose to allow a delegation from Whitehall and Westminster, but maintain Windsor as the focus. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, not, not as much as you would expect, I think. Um, the, the main thing that I would point to, and this is actually before, before Cleon or Pericles, who is not normally regarded as such a, a rabble rouser, but uh, one of the things he famously did is uh, institute a, a citizenship law, which um, uh, excluded everyone from citizenship that didn't have both, you know, both parents as uh, native Athenians. Um, and there seems to be a context as well um, where suddenly all kinds of material benefits come, you know, become available to Athenian citizens. So they're then trying to cut down who actually gets a, gets a share. Um, so at that point, it's at the middle of the fifth century, there's, there's definitely a moment where uh, Athens becomes more uh, exclusive, you know, really uh, keeps out um, uh, or, or deprives of certain, at least informal rights, uh, the, the sort of non-native inhabitants of whom there are many. And it's, it's quite clear that Athens um, population expanded really quickly in the early uh, fifth century, uh, which must mean uh, a lot of um, immigration, essentially. Um, but as I say at the start, I mean, it, it's not, um, I, I would have expected, <laughs> given modern parallels, a, a lot more um, evidence in, in the text that we have um, all for kind of anti-foreigner kind of ret rhetoric. Uh, and there really isn't, uh, isn't that much. Being elected, it strikes me that that having them, um, that, that oligarchs and strongmen are kind of the bad way of harnessing power or using populism to its populist channels on the end. But actually, what is quite effective is institutionalizing populism, you know, using police science or the monarchy. I mean, that's a, it's an excellent point. And I think certainly the strongmen I'm dealing with desperately try to do that all the time, particularly through dynastization. So making sure that you know your heirs can follow you and maybe get some statutes that that confirm it and so on. Um, very interesting is how often that fails. So I said uh, so there's this prosopographical work that was done by colleagues. They counted 400 of these strongmen. The vast majority of them, one or two generations at the very most. Um, and the, that sort of raised the question of what conditions need to be right for this sort of institutionalization to work. And one of the problems, certainly in my city, I'm interested to hear more at, at your end, is that these cities are incredibly unstable. They're full of lots of different bodies, lots of different institutions. You've got guilds, you've got neighborhoods, you've got uh, um, popular coalitions of various sorts arising. And it's really difficult to keep all of these under sort of one mantle. And that's what often brings these uh, lords down. My example of institutionalization, you know, ostracism um, uh, is, is interesting, I think, partly uh, because it does seem to work uh, quite well for quite, quite a long time. Uh, according to the um, later stories that we get about the end of it, which actually comes near the end of the fifth century, um, you know, so before the sort of more stable democracy of the, the fourth century, um, the story goes that they stopped doing it because at one point, um, 
the, the elite I think, candidates for ostracism put their heads together uh, and made sure that one of the demagogues was sent, you know, was sent into exile. Uh, you know, the story says, you know, the, the lowest status person, uh, you know, of them all. Uh, actually, this hyperbolus, who then subsequently, although already in exile, was still assassinated. So they, they really hated him. Um, but uh, but any, so that, that suggests, on the one hand, um, institutionalized populism can work for quite a while, but in this case, the elite somehow got a handle on that and, and managed to, uh, to overthrow it. So I think that's a really brilliant point. Um, and I think there's just a couple of things that, that I, I would agree. I think it is um, in the British case, the, the, the war can be read as an example of populism being more effective when, it, when institutionalized because it's kept with it. it you know, the monarchy borrows these tools from populism and kind of makes them their own. It's one of the kind of hege hegemonic process going on there. Um, but I think there's other things at play here too. So if we think about British elites in this period, access to becoming one of the elites was actually quite open. It was a question of making a lot of money. Um, and so because of the nature of late 19th century industrialization in Britain, a lot of people had got access to that. So there isn't quite the sense of ordinary people versus the elites as you get in some of the other countries that, that I mentioned. And um, the British elites, a lot of ordinary people have managed to get into them and make a lot of money and are, are quite, quite, you know, are still, so there's still this kind of sense of it, um, of a kind of, free flow there a little bit. There's also a question that populism in the war is very fragmented in Britain. So um, I should, uh, you know, I was discussing populism on the left, on the right, it, it, there isn't one kind of head of steam around one organization or one group that could actually break through. So, so I think that's because it's sort of neutralized by its, by, 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 the, by the monarchy borrowing a lot of these tools, but also the, by the fact that actually uh, the British democratic system is still functioning during the war. Parliament is still meeting. There isn't this va vacuum. Uh, into which populism could, could, could take over. And then the final thing that's a bit different is I think populism on its own can't rival the sacralization that the monarchy brings to the table. So that idea of a very, um, you know, special specific kind of role, the anointed king, that is still very much there. And although, although there's, there are kind of cynics among the aristocracy who, who kind of behind closed doors complain about it, um, it is, it is very much, you know, when you think of figures of speech amongst people talking about the king, God bless, and they always add this, this honorific after they speak about him. So, so, there, so, so it's, not, it's, not, it's, not our, it's not the Second World War yet. It's not the 1960s yet. There's a sacralization element that means that ultimately the monarchy has the trump card when it comes to, when it comes to, 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 to kind of rivaling the populace. Victory also matters too. So victory in the war is really important. And, and there is that question going back to counterfactuals. What would have happened if Britain had lost? And that's the big question. Would, it, would the monarchy be able to still use these populist tools that have developed along with its sacralized position in society to hold through? I think probably yes, but that's just, uh, that's just a guess. I think we should end on that really interesting and factual. Um, and thank our speakers again and head to the reception in South Boisters.